Hey everybody, welcome back to RPG Imaginings. This is the first of a two-part series that I'm going to do for how the magic system works in the Rivers of London RPG. And I delayed making these videos before uh, I had a chance to read at least a couple of Ben Aronovich's novels uh, in the Peter Grant saga uh, the first one was called Midnight Riot here in the United States, but it was called Rivers of London in the UK. And the second is Moon Over Soho. And I have really enjoyed reading these novels. It is the style of urban magic fantasy detective work that I am very much interested in. There are a lot of other series, um, one of them in particular, very popular. I've tried them. I haven't liked them. I love Ben Aronic Aronovich's Peter Grant series. And part of the reason why I wanted to read these novels is because uh, understanding how the magic system works, I think, is critical to understanding Rivers of London, the RPG, because magic is a huge component of the game, but it operates differently than what m one might expect if you have other uh, experience with other role playing games. And I'll just draw two quick comparisons. So in a typical fantasy role-playing game, there are no costs to the individual to use magic at all. Magic uh, is readily available, and usually there is access to a ton of different spells in a typical fantasy game setting. Let's contrast that with Call of Cthulhu, where casting any spell in Call of Cthulhu can have massive implications on the character, whether from the perspective of sanity or even permanent changes to the character in terms of loss of uh, pow. And I think that the London's of uh, Rivers of London RPG RPG strikes a balance that not only is very reflective of what magic is like in the novels, which I find to be one of the most interesting aspects of the novels because Peter Grant, the main character in the novels, is actively learning magic, but the learning process, the learning curve is tremendous. It is incredibly difficult. And I think that Paul Fricker and Lynn Hardy and friends in this RPG did a really good job of uh catching the spirit of the novels while simultaneously being open to doing what is fun for role-playing games. And I think that the magic system in Rivers of London is very reflective of the books while also being awesome for role-playing. And uh, so I'm excited to share it with all of you because I think that it's a really fresh take on magic in a role-playing system. And ultimately, we have to thank Ben Aronovich for it because he is the one who conceived of uh, the characters and the situations and how he wanted to reflect magic in his novels. Um, so in this first part, we are going to talk about some of the detective work that is involved in using magic in Rivers of London, because the other thing is that's really important to understand in the Peter Grant series is that he is a police officer in London. And so he is largely using magic, uh, not only in an offensive or defensive capacity, but more so in an investigative capacity. And that is really important and central to the feel of what type of role playing game and story this is. And then we'll talk about how to cast spells and some of the costs of casting spells and some of the variations that exist in costing spells that are part and parcel to this system. In the second video, we'll go ahead and uh, dive into the spells themselves and understand a bit about how they work, how they can be combined, that spells are not just isolated in the system, and I'm very excited to share that with all of you. And so let's start off by talking about Vestigia. Vestigia is a critical part of storytelling in Rivers of London because Vestigia is essentially a source of clues in the game. Only instead of the clue being something physical, the clue is an impression that the investigator gets from sensing the environment around them. 
And so a vestigia is the leftovers of magic that is left over after magic has been cast in an area or after an individual who has been present in an area. And the game breaks it down in terms of three ways in which you could detect vestigia in your environment. It would be weak, strong, or extremely strong. Weak vestigia have been around for a very long time and includes the underlying levels of vestigia that surround us in our general environment, sort of like background information. Strong vestigia, usually involved with recent magic use or supernatural occurrences. It can also be generated by human activity, especially that involving strong emotions, festivals, football matches, um, but even some low-key events like a village uh, feat can leave traces. And then extremely strong vestigia uh, leaves a stain on the environment, such as where a massacre has happened or um, a hostile force has been involved. Um, and this is an example of vestigia where even somebody who hasn't uh, honed their magic senses can be well aware of it. Uh, and so the book presents rules for detecting vestigia. If it's very strong, there's no role required. If it's strong vestigia, it's just a regular success uh, on uh, the sense vestigia skill would allow one to detect it. And then for weak vestigia, uh, a regular uh, success permits someone to detect it and a uh, hard success permits someone to detect all of that particular vestigious elements. And so sort of the distinction between what is the particular nature of that. And the book does a really good job. Here's a table right here of a uh, type of vestigia that one might encounter encounter and how it might be related to a possible clue that an investigator in the system would uh, find. And so this is going to be very critical for clue setup for the Rivers of London RPG. And so something that the game master needs to be very, 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 very aware of. Um, and it proposes things that if uh, investigators are struggling to figure out what a particular vestigia means. You could proctor an int roll, sort of like, you know, what you would do in Call of Cthulhu with an ideas roll. Um, and it also makes the point, if the clue is essential, just let the investigators have it without a roll. There's no need for a roll, okay, if it's something that is critical to the situations. Um there's also this little table here that indicates that uh, some materials are going to be able to hold vestigia in the environment better than others. And this is something that I really enjoyed in reading the novels in that when uh, Peter Grant is trying to take uh, a quasi-scientific approach to investigating magic while simultaneously... Um, recognizing that there is this arcane or mystical nature to it as well. And so he's not just going to rest on the laurels, so to speak, of the mystical nature of magic, but also try to, he does little experiments throughout the novels to try to figure out how this stuff works. And that's something that I've been particularly interested in reading the novels. Now we move on to Signare. Uh, signare is uh, the signature that an individual leaves uh whenever they use uh, magic in a particular location. And so the text says, um, just as an expert can determine whether a painting is a genuine old master by studying the brush strokes and techniques, so can a practitioner detect uh, subtleties in the casting of a spell that dis distinguishes who performed it. Each practitioner has their own unique signare, but an element of a master's signare is passed on to any apprentices they may teach. And so in the novels, Peter Grant senses Nightingale's signare as being like the sound of cymbals, as heavy as a mallet and as sharp and controlled as the point of a needle. There's also a tick-tock precision and the smell of willow. Uh, this clockwork precision is passed on to Leslie May, whose signare combines the tick-tock element with the razor strop and a seagull's cry. And so uh, this has also been an element in the novels, you know, uh, sort of light... Um, light spoilers for the novels uh, in which uh, 
Nightingale and Grant have been uh, chasing a major antagonist, so to speak. And as time goes by in the novels, they get more and more hints of Signaris of very powerful casters that they're dealing with who have been hiding underneath the... Um, the veil of secrecy. And so there's a lot of guidance here as to how one could create uh, an investigator's signare in the game. So if you're using magic in the game, you have to choose the magical advantage during character creation. And anyone who subsequently takes the magic skill as one of their six, six starting skills, say that, six times fast, uh, needs to create their own signare so other practitioners and members of the Demimon can recognize them for who and what they are. And there's a lot of guidance, a great table here as to how you can uh, develop your signare. Um, of course, you could just come up with it entirely on your own, or you could roll on a table, or you could select from the table. And so there's a column for sound, a column for smell, a column for other sensations, and this goes on and on and on. It's a D100 table. So there's lots of inspiration here to encourage investigators to develop their own signare of how they might be in, uh, uh, identified by other casters. And, you know, in an investigative game, there's a lot of uh, joy in sort of a push and pull of how much you can pick up from the vestigia of a location, magic being used in a particular location, how old that signature is, how weak or strong that signature is, and then also potentially picking up the signare of a caster and tracking them over locations. And that is something that I've really enjoyed in reading the novels and I think is a really... Um, powerful aspect of the investigative nature of the world. Now we're going to move on to Newtonian spells. And the rules here for Newtonian spells really allow for quite a lot of options, I would say. I had mentioned at the beginning of the video that there's kind of a middle ground that is struck for magic in Rivers of London that I really appreciate. Um, there are costs to using magic in this system, but the costs are not as extreme as you would expect for Call of Cthulhu. There aren't as many spells as there are in a high fantasy setting, a typical fantasy role-playing game. But there is variation in terms of how extensively a caster will master spells and how spells are combined together to produce individual effects, which I think is really interesting because it allows for added creativity. And I'll talk about the potential for creativity in my second video on Newtonian magic in the Rivers of London role-playing game. And so... Uh, to get us started right off the bat, um, almost all casters in Rivers of London will start with Wear Light as their primary spell, and that is uh, a first order spell. Spells are ordered according to their order, first, second, third, fourth, or fifth, and... Um, uh, learning second order spells is dependent upon having uh, some mastery of first order spells. We'll get to the specific rules of that here shortly. Let's go ahead and read this Ben Says uh, segment right here, because this is guidance directly from the author of the novels. And so that makes for a really good partnership between a particular uh, intellectual property and a role playing company and the author. Newtonian magic in the world of Rivers of London is complex and in Involved. A system that reflected all its nuance and idiosyncrasies would be longer than this book and probably not that much fun. By necessity, the system presented here abstracts much of that complexity to smooth the playing experience. And I agree with Ben there. It is very evident that Paul and Lynn have done a really good job of finding a really good balance point of reflecting the nature of magic as it's presented in the novels, but not making it so complex that it's not unfun for a role playing game. So, all investigators in this game begin the game with two first order spells, but note that one is mastered and one is unmastered, and then one second order unmastered spell. Okay, some spells have prerequisites for learning them. There's a distinction between being a Newtonian apprentice of an actual practitioner of magic versus hedge wizards, which a hedge wizard is just someone who has discovered their inherent 
power. So for Newtonian apprentices, all investigators beginning the game as a Newtonian practitioner's apprentice, like Peter Grant is to Nightingale in the novels, start with Wear Light as their mastered spell. And then a common spec second spell to learn is impello. And, you know, impello, there's a lot of uh, hints to the Latin here. We are going to impel or push something. And so impello is the movement spell in the spellcasting provenance of Newtonian magic. Um, hedge wizards sort of figure it out on their own. The choice of spells for a hedge wizard is entirely open, but again, they should start play with two first order spells, one of which is mastered and a second order spell, which is unmastered. Okay. And there's an example here. Nafisa is an apprentice New Newtonian practitioner. And so automatically starts with wear light plus two other spells of her choosing. Her player picks the first order spell in Pello and the second order spell fireball. Morgan is a hedge wizard and chooses the first order spells flash bulb mastered and aqua and the second order spell shield. Okay. What are the advantages for mastering a spell? Uh, and what is the process? Well, um, casting a spell carries inherent risks in Rivers of London, the RPG, just like Call of Cthulhu, but the risks are not as extreme as they are in Call of Cthulhu. So the big risk of mastering spells, and this is dealt with, uh, as you get into the second novel of Rivers of London, uh, there is this idea called hyperthaumaturgical degradation. The idea that uh, spellcasting takes a toll on an individual's brain in this game. Um, that doesn't mean that there also aren't advantages of spellcasting, and I won't give you any uh, specific spoilers for that because I think that it's fun to discover as you read the novels. Apprentice practitioners schooled by a master of New Newtonian magic begin play with the spell wear light. Okay. Once a spell is mastered, the player should check the mastered box next to the spell's name on the character sheet. A mastered spell gains a bonus die to the magic skill roll made to cast it. And um, during the investor, uh, investigator development phase, you can spend one development point to let, select one of an investigator's unmastered spells and mark it as mastered. Now, when we turn the page... We have more information about learning more spells. During each investigator development phase, a player has the option of spending one development point to learn a new spell. An investigator must know two spells of a given order before they can learn spells belonging to the order above. In addition, the balance of the orders of spells known by an investigator cannot be top-heavy, i.e. an investigator can never know more spells in any given order than they know in any of the orders below it. Uh, and I'm just going to go ahead and turn uh, ahead to the Impello spell tree. Well, actually, you know, we should go to the spell list for orders. And so here the book is very clear about indicating which spells exist within a particular order. And then there's... Um, Good labeling here as to whether or not a spell has any prerequisites, whether it's a single isolated spell in of itself, whether it is a combination of multiple spells together. And uh, yeah, so uh, casting spells requires a magic skill roll, and it must be made when attempting to cast the spell. The caster is uh, uh, unless the caster is pressed for time. So we'll learn more about that here later on when we talk about spell casting rolls. You need a certain number of magic points to be spent before it can be cast. And just like a classic BRP system, I've referred to Rivers of London, the role-playing game, as BRP Light. Um, but uh, just like the BRP system, magic points are determined by the power statistic. And it takes one combat round or the narrative equivalent to cast a spell the same amount of time it takes to throw a punch or fire a gun in combat. Um it takes up the caster's turn. Various factors can affect whether or not the spellcasting roll gains a bonus die. We're going to see a table here in a second for that. And the standard rules uh, for multiple bonus or penalty dice apply to spellcasting rolls as well. Um, you have to use magic points to cast spells. An investigator begins the game with magic points equal to one-fifth their pow, plus one point for their mastered first order spell. Every time an investigator masters a spell, they gain another magic point. Nice. Uh, spent magic points regenerate naturally, returning to their normal maximum value for the next scene. Okay, and so this is not... Um, 
determined by hours like it is in Call of Cthulhu. The base cost of attempting to cast a spell is the number of magic points e equal to the spell's order. The cost of a master's spell can be boosted if the caster wishes to increase or alter its effect. And we're going to read about boosting spells here coming up. Not all spells can be boosted. Once a practitioner runs out of magic points, they may continue to cast spells, but this may cause them harm, hyperthaumaturgical degradation, and there is no need to track negative magic points, but a practitioner must roll for HTD every time they attempt to cast a spell when they have zero magic points available. Uh, one of the mechanics that I really like in this game, which I think is appropriate, is there's this phrase called the next scene that is used to indicate the passing of time between one scene and the next. Um, it's necessary that a short period of time passes between scenes. Moving from one room of a house to the next is not sufficient time, whereas driving across London from one location to another is. And I prefer this to, you know, tracking of hours, uh, which is common in BRP. Um, the next scene is an appropriate thing to do for an investigative game because you go to a lot of different uh, places to investigate clues. How do spell casting roles work? Well... Casting a spell requires skill and concentration. You make a magic skill roll, and um, some of these rolls will uh, have bonus dice. Um, a regular success means that the spell works. A failure means that it kind of works, and it's in the hands of the game master. They get to decide exactly what happens. And a fumble means that the caster is drained of all magic points and must roll for hyperthaumaturgical degradation. And you may be saying in your head, hey, no fair, I lose all my magic points if I fumble a spell roll. Well, this is in the spirit of what happens in the novels, that there is concentration and uh, that has to happen in order for one to summon one's magic skills. And so I think that that is a uh, fully appropriate choice given the narrative. Um, if the spell casting is made under unusual circumstances, uh, then this is covered under casting uh, in exceptional circumstances that we'll talk about here in a second. Um, for example, if speed is of the essence or if you're fighting back with magic, um, there's a difference for that compared to if a caster has unlimited time and no other pressing concerns, uh, the GM should just let the spell work. Okay. Um, luck points can be spent to turn a casting failure into a success, but as usual, they cannot be used to buy off a fumble. Okay. Which is typical for other BRP games. This table summarizes pretty succinctly the difference between mastered and unmastered spells. Mastered spells can be boosted. You get a bonus die to a spell casting roll. If you're under exceptional circumstances, your bonus die cancels out the normal penalty die to a spell casting roll. And in combat, the bonus die to spell casting roll cancels out any one penalty die incurred as a result of a combat situation, such as the target diving for cover. In combat for an unmastered spell, a bonus or penalty die to the spellcasting uh, roll happens based upon the combat situation. And uh, that is also summarized up here under spellcasting and combat. But uh, there are some additional things here as well. As well. The damage rolls for spell usually uses the caster's dex to reflect that they are attempting to hit a target. Thus, use dex rather than power strength when cons uh, consulting the damage roll section which happened prior in the book. As with a firearms attack, spellcasting rolls in combat are subject to the same bonuses and penalties as firearms because you are aiming, and the target of a spell during combat uh, has the same response options uh, as if they are being shot at, which classically in BRP, that would be diving for cover. Your only chance is to fling yourself behind something. Otherwise, it's just based upon range. Uh, or in the case of Rivers of London, you can fight back against spellcasting rolls. Okay? Uh, speaking of failing spellcasting rolls, if an investigator fails their magic roll to cast a spell, 
uh, an investigator can spend luck rolls or they can push the roll, which this is a distinct thing that is different from Call of Cthulhu. And I really appreciate about it for, from a perspective of flavor for Rivers of London, because there are many situations in the book in which Peter Grant fails, but he will call upon his reserves to attempt to be successful. And it doesn't always work the way that he that he plans, but that just makes the narrative more interesting. Um, so uh, pushing a spell casting roll. Okay. If the initial magic roll to cast a spell is failed, the magic points are still spent. And as long as the investigator is not using magic in combat, the player immediately has the option to push the roll with a bonus die. If the spell is mastered, pushing a spell casting roll can be done by screwing up your eyes and focusing really hard on the shapes in your mind or yelling the formae at the top of your lungs. Formae are the Latin words, um, or by some other means that makes sense for that particular spell. If the push roll is successful, the spell is successful. If it's failed, the spell works normally, but the caster is drained of all magic points and must roll for hypothaumaturgical uh, degradation. So the costs are even greater than if you just cast the spell normally. If the push roll is fumbled, the caster is drained of all magic points and you must roll on the HTD table with a penalty die. Uh, GM advice, pushing a spell casting roll forces the spell to work, but at the risk of self-inflicted harm, thus pushing a spell casting roll is a gamble for the player. Uh, it's, it's, um, not as nasty perhaps as Call of Cthulhu, but remember in Call of Cthulhu, you don't even have an option to push the roll. And I think it's appropriate to the flavor of Rivers of London that pushing is an option here. What about casting in exceptional circumstances? The environment in which one performs a spell can have an effect upon the casting. Areas imbued with, mas with magic can intensify, damp dampen, or alter the effects of a spell. Casting a spell in exceptional circumstances if inflicts a penalty die on the character's magic skill roll. The bonus die gain from mastering a spell cancels out the penalty die. And we follow the normal procedures for whether or not a spell works or does not work. Okay, And that leads us to the section on spells themselves, in which we learn about the spell list, the different spell trees that you can learn over the course of... Um, investigating magic in this world and it actually describes all of the spells in detail and so we will deal with that in much greater detail in part two of this video and when i post part two of the video i will make sure that the end card at the end of this video links directly to that part two so that you all can go there and so i hope that you enjoyed this beginning look into newtonian magic in the rivers of london role-playing game i think that it is a very unique user-friendly friendly system and it reflects the natures of the novels really really well and uh i appreciate that chaosium sent me this copy of rivers of london the role-playing game because i have really enjoyed reading the novels rivers of london in preparation for this video and i'm going to be hope to be playing rivers of london sometime soon and so thanks everybody for watching part two will be coming up shortly have a great day everybody Bye bye